big parade in Nairobi. And in Kenya, when the bands play and crowds of this size turn out, it's usually in honor of one man, Kenyan President Jomo Kenyatta. Ladies and gentlemen, many years have passed since it was decided to declare and to commemorate Kenyatta days as a symbol of national unity. This was the latest Kenyatta Day, celebrating the president's arrest 24 years ago by the British, who then ruled Kenya. In the years since then, this remarkable man has developed from an obscure anti-colonialist leader into one of the foremost statesmen in Africa today. But though his international reputation is secure, his position at home is not so clear-cut. There's uncertainty about who will replace him, and there's muffled but very definite opposition to his rule. To his many supporters, President Kenyatta is a revered, unassailable figure, a father to the nation, just as he is to his own extensive family. This was the recent wedding in Nairobi of one of his nephews. Kenyatta himself married four times and has eight children. Multiplied by marriage and with fresh generations added, his family is now at the very center of Kenya's social and political structure. To his opponents, though, it's a clan, a tightly knit group which has carved out more than its fair share of Kenya's wealth and influence. The president's daughter, Margaret, occupies a crucial position as mayor of Nairobi. When a deputy recently challenged her re-election, he lost his party membership. The president's current wife, Mama Gaynor, is widely believed to be one of the richest women in Kenya. It's all a very long way from the president's own beginnings, as a poor orphan boy whose education started here, at the Church of Scotland Mission near Muruanga. In five years here, he became a Christian and learned to read and write. He was a sickly child, and while he was here, he underwent an operation on his spine, which probably saved his life. He later studied abroad and spent many years in England, marrying an English wife in 1943. Jomo Kenyatta, the name was an adopted one, emerged first as a leader of his own tribe, the Kikuyu. He denied any involvement with the terror campaign of the Kikuyu-dominated Mau Mau rebellion of the 1950s, but he was nevertheless imprisoned for seven years. Britain released him in 1961, hoping his countrymen would pay little heed to this old man. He was then over 70. But the wind of change was already blowing over Africa, and in 1963, the British withdrew completely from the former colony. When they did so, the man they left in power was Jomo Kenyatta, the country's first premier and already revered as the father of the nation. One of Kenyatta's first acts as leader was to appeal to those Mau Mau fighters who were still in the bush and had been too frightened to surrender while the British still ruled. Kenyatta assured them he understood their grievances and would put them right. Most of those grievances concerned land. Under colonial rule, much of the best land in Kenya had been reserved exclusively for white settlers. Africans could work in these areas only as laborers. The Mau Mau rebellion began because Kikuyu militants saw themselves disinherited from their traditional tribal lands. And they directed their chief violence against those who had installed on those lands a little England of lush farms and large houses. In the last few years before independence, the colonial government began to admit Africans to the European areas. When Kenyatta came to power, he speeded up the process, though he didn't drive the Europeans out. Those who wanted to leave were bought out, 
and their estates divided into small plots and redistributed among landless Africans, many of them Kikuyus. The process is still going on, although there's a tendency now to turn the land over to African-run farming cooperatives. Agriculture is by far Kenya's biggest industry, providing most of the country's exports and employing three quarters of the population. In trade too, Kenyatta has moved to increase African participation. It began in 1969 when non-Kenyan traders, most of them Asians holding British passports, had their licenses withdrawn. It provoked a panic exodus of Asians, but those with Kenyan passports were allowed to stay in business. Last year, the policy was stepped up when foreign-owned companies were ordered to be sold to Africans. African businessmen now get loans to help them buy such companies, as well as priority over non-Kenyan competition for government contracts. Another government agency, meanwhile, concentrates on training Africans in a wide range of industrial skills. The declared aim is not simply to provide factory hands, but to promote a new class of African entrepreneurs. About a quarter of the students now go into business on their own account after completing the courses. Nairobi's mushrooming skyline tells a similar story. President Kenyatta's Kenya is a land of private enterprise. Under his guidance, there have been 13 years of political and economic stability, and that's attracted a lot of foreign aid and investment. But the resulting prosperity has not been equally shared out. The president's critics say a lot has gone to the ruling family itself. It's certainly true that the family does own valuable city centre buildings, as well as agricultural land, though the extent of its wealth is difficult to determine. Another allegation is that undue wealth and political influence has gone to the president's Kikuyu tribe. Kenya's inequalities are visible on the streets of the capital, but though the begging is relatively open, it's hardly of scandalous proportions. Poverty is widespread, though, and it can be seen cheek by jowl with Nairobi's expensive high-rise blocks. This is the other Nairobi, of squalid shanties. It's populated mainly by people who've drifted in from the countryside in the hope of exchanging the back-breaking toil of subsistence agriculture for a well-paid city job. A few years ago, it was estimated that as many as a quarter of the city's inhabitants lived in conditions like this. Nairobi's population is increasing by nearly 40,000 a year, and by the end of the century, a million people could be looking for jobs in and around the capital. On current estimates, fewer than two-thirds will be able to find them. Unemployment has been a national problem for years. Kenya's economy has faltered badly in the last year or two, mainly due to the oil crisis and the resulting recession. Since there's no domestic oil, the steeply rising cost of oil imports has played havoc with Kenya's balance of payments. It's come as a particularly heavy blow to a country which had grown accustomed to a sure and steady growth in prosperity. A 14% devaluation just over a year ago helped to boost exports and imported goods, especially luxury ones, have either been banned or subjected to increasingly heavy duties. At the same time, government expenditure has been drastically cut. The main bright spot is coffee, one of Kenya's most valuable exports. This year's crop was excellent, and prices on the world market are high. Even so, the cost of living is still rising by about 20% a year, and Kenya's finance minister has called on the nation to work harder and spend less. Another cause for optimism is the tourist industry. 1976 was probably the best year yet. The government's now set up a special department to improve wildlife conservation and persuade Kenyans to recognize its vital importance to the nation's economy. 
On the political front, Kenya's progress has been mixed. The country is a parliamentary democracy with nationwide elections. Many aspects of the system were modelled on the Westminster pattern. But since 1969, there's been one important exception. Only one political party is allowed, and that's KANU, the Kenyan African National Union, founded by President Kenyatta. The system has contributed a great deal to Kenya's political stability. But critics of the regime claim that it's only done this by stifling any real political opposition. Coupled with the allegations of Kikuyu favoritism, it's produced bitter resentment amongst some Kenyans who feel that the right to vote is not by itself any guarantee of democracy. It's certainly true that serious political opposition to Kenyatta has never been easy. Oginga Odinga was the country's first vice president and once a staunch colleague of Kenyatta. But in 1966, he resigned from the government and formed his own opposition party. It was banned and he and his supporters were imprisoned. Although he's now been released, his career as a national politician is at an end. Tom Mboya was Kenya's brilliant Minister of Economic Development, who was tipped as a successor to Kenyatta himself. Like Odinga, he was a member of the Luo tribe, and his presence in the government did much to maintain tribal harmony. As long as he was there, most Luos felt they could trust the government, despite its Kikuyu majority. But in 1969, Mboya was shot dead by a Kikuyu gunman. His death had a shattering impact on the nation, and the Luos especially felt betrayed and leaderless. At the funeral, their grief turned to anger, and a riot developed outside the cathedral. For a moment, it looked as if Kenya was heading towards the tribal conflict which many had predicted before independence. The president rode out the storm, and the assassin was arrested and later executed. Two years ago, the murder of J.M. Kariuki raised an almost identical storm of protest. Kariuki, known to his friends and supporters simply as J.M., was a former private secretary of Kenyatta who had become a vocal critic of the government. He was last seen alive in the company of the head of Kenya's security police. Nine days later, his bullet-riddled body was found in the city morgue by one of his three widows. Although a relatively wealthy man himself, Kariuki had campaigned for years on behalf of Kenya's poorer classes. In Parliament, as an unofficial opposition leader, he'd called for wide-ranging social reforms and had accused the government of installing a new African elite, which was no more interested in redistributing the nation's wealth than the colonial regime had been. A parliamentary investigation into his death pointed the finger at the security chief and other prominent members of the regime, but the report was rejected by government ministers. <laughs> Kariuki had been genuinely popular among the ordinary people, and his murder provoked both grief and outrage. In Parliament, criticism of the government reached unprecedented levels of openness. On the streets, there were riots which echoed the reaction to Mboya's death. The riots, though, were soon quelled, and it wasn't long before Parliament was restored to its normal respectful attitude. Several MPs who had openly supported the critical report on the murder lost their jobs. President Kenyatta has since made it clear that he intends to crack down even more harshly on any dissidents. The hawk, he said, is always ready to swoop down from the sky. He certainly means it, for as far as he is concerned, attacks on the government are irrelevant to Kenya's problems, and they serve only to weaken the nation's resolve. It's not an atmosphere in which a natural successor can emerge. The president is now at least 85, and though he's in remarkably good health, he clearly can't go on forever. And 
The question of his successor is now an increasingly worrying one for Kenyan politicians of all shades of opinion. There are many men of the necessary caliber, but few have had the chance to attract national support. One contender is the current vice premier, Daniel Arap Moy. The constitution makes him the lawful successor for 90 days following the president's death, but it's unlikely that Moy has the backing to assume the position permanently. A few months ago, in fact, some MPs even tried to amend the constitution to prevent him being even a temporary president. The move was squashed by the government, but to the question, if not Moy, who, there is still no answer. For the average Kenyan, the succession is less of a burning issue, overshadowed by the more immediate problems of the cost of living and so on. And in recent months, the external threat from Uganda has done much to unite the nation. But underneath, tribal tensions still run deep. And those tensions will certainly emerge in one form or another when the moment finally comes to choose someone to replace the country's first president. Whatever his critics may say, President Kenyatta has for the past 13 years stamped his image on Kenya in a way no other single man could have done. And yet ironically, Kenya's greatest potential danger lies in precisely this close identity between man and nation and in Kenyatta's own determination to remain the apparently ageless father of his people.